about is basically just a simple way of training facilitators. That's, he's just showing you some of the components that you can use for facilitators. But one of my favorite things to do, and we're just not going to do it today because of time, is actually I love to break people up. I, I get a table full of actors, okay? And I ask them to exaggerate different types of people that you might have in your small group. So up here, all right, you have the, the second guy over, okay? What do you think he's doing? No, no, no. He's <laughs> now he's the side conversationalist, okay? Oh. So he's talking to the person next to him, right? Uh. Did you ever have that in a group? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's really difficult when, you know, you're trying to, the whole table's talking or the whole group is talking and somebody's talking to the person on the side. All right, so the side conversationalist is a tough person in the group. The next one, I think, therefore I am. What kind of a personality is that? Philosopher. Yeah, philosopher. He's coming out of his head, isn't he? But not uh, about sharing from the heart. Okay, so he could be like a little bit argumentative. Thomas Aquinas says, you know, or something like that. Okay, and the next guy over here, who's holding people hostage, who is he? The dominator, the monopolizer, right? So, did you ever have a monopolizer in the group? Okay. So, one of the great things about working in a small group is you have to keep a sense of humor, all right? So, if somebody's dominating a group like that, I might say, wow, Dave, Dave, you have a lot to say on that subject. That's really great. What else does anyone else have to say? So you can just quickly shift it off. So you don't need a huge amount of group dynamic work to learn how to do this, but you just need to know how to pass it off to somebody else. So now that lady down the bottom, who's she? That's going to be a tough one. No, she's not complaining. The church lady, not The socializer. The socializer, right? She's telling a story. Every time you tell a story, she's going to say, that happened to me, and you know, my dog died, and, it, or you know, she'll go on and on about a uh, one-up one up your story. Yeah, one-up your story. <laughs> now, in this case, she doesn't really mean it, but in, in other cases, somebody might one-up your, one your story. So, um, okay, how about the guy there run, uh, jumping across the table? What does he say? What's he that he says, argue? that can't be true. Oh, oh yeah, the challenger. The challenger, right, or uh, a person who is always saying, you know, what are you talking about? So when you guys were talking before about having, like, different uh, philosophies in a group, you can have some of that sometimes. So that's where you either might have to say, okay, whoa, 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 let's calm down, let's take a breath here, let's, are we focused on what we're supposed to be focusing on, or have we drifted, you know? So with my group, I have a wonderful group of people. And, but they are like herding cats. They're all side conversationalists. Okay, they're my adult faith formation team. They're all side conversationalists. They're all storytellers. Okay, they're all, you know, uh, monopolizers. They're, they are so funny. I have to always stop and go, okay, hang on. Where are we? And they go, oh yeah, okay. And just pull them back together again. So it's fun. I mean, we laugh, we have a great time but uh, they have to be reminded. Now you got a guy under the table there. Who's that person? <laughs> the shy one. The shy one, okay? Somebody who doesn't want to talk in a group, is nervous about it, doesn't think he or she knows enough, whatever. I have to tell you, I'm an introvert, and my first time I had to be in a small group, I thought I was going to die, because I, I felt like I was walking to my death, okay? Because I figured somebody's going to ask me a question, and I'm not going to know the answer. So, um, a lot of times with a shy person, you want to help them participate in the group, mm -hmm. at least so their voice can be heard, have them do the reading, have them do something else. I never call on anybody and say, what do you think? Okay, I just don't. I just don't think it's the right thing to do. But I will engage them in a different way in the context of the, of the group. And finally, up there, the guy with the sweat coming out of his head, that's the facilitator trying to control the <laughs> So when you do 
to facilitate her training, it's a riot to do like a fishbowl thing, you know, and have all the actors really exaggerate the role. But it's just fun, and people get the hints and so forth. So with my group, I have to show them these pictures to remind them of who they might be in the group. But we just laugh. But it's important to always set, uh, like, the, the ground rules, if you will you know, ahead of time. So usually a lot of the materials that you buy will have some ground rules in them. So that's, that's just like a fun thing to do with that. But this is really serious, and I want you to think very seriously about some of the groups that you might be a part of, or some of the groups in your parish. So basically I say there's four types of groups, all right? So this first one is the inward focus group, all right? It's a group that can be together for too long, they don't allow other people in. You see that, does anybody have one of those figures? You know, it's called the circle of friends. Yeah. You do? Do you like them? Okay, I would take them out to the parking lot and smash them, all right? Why? Why am I saying it, Nancy? You have five of them, Nancy? Why do I say smash it? Because they're closed. It's a closed group. I understand the concept and all that, and you have a candle in the middle, we're all united in Christ. I know all that. However, a lot, a lot of groups, okay, are like that. So think in your parish, not just the small communities, I'm not talking, it could be any ministry groups in your parish that are actually inward focused groups. So an inward focused group is, you know, they have an inner life, right? But look at the circle. Remember the circle we put up with the six elements? Yeah. So they have a lot of the right-hand side. They might be prayer. They might have support. Okay, they'll have a lot of reflection. But they're missing the left side of the circle. All right? And it's important to, to think about that. So we say they have a lot of relationship, but this group doesn't have mission. And I can tell you just when you look at parish groups, how many people who are younger don't join groups because they think they're closed groups. And I mean ministries, I'm not just talking about uh, small Christian communities, all right? And that's something we don't realize that could happen. I was working with a parish once and they, ha they did what I call the parish wine. Wine, wine, wine. They're not joining, nobody's participating, the same people are doing the same things all the time, you know? So we did a whole process about what do you need in your ministry, what would you like to do, what's your, you know, dreams, etc. and we made a plan. And the plan was that I would come back six months later and find out how they're working on the plan. And the group that whined the loudest did not do any recruitment or any change because they were this group. They didn't want to change. And so it's very important that we take a look at who we are as a group. So that's the first group. Here's the second group, the impoverished group. Now this group is interesting because, you know, they're not really sure why they're existing. They might ne not necessarily know what their mission is as a group. Now, even though they might have a name in terms of a ministry, they still might be this group because they don't really know where they're going. There's no planning, there's no futuring, there's no uh, how do we recruit people, how do we train people, how do we form people, they're just kind of lost. So when you look at a group like that, we say they have no mission and no relationship because those essential elements are not part of their group. Okay? Are you clicking in your head the groups in your parish that might be like that? All right, another group, outward focus group. Now here's the opposite. So this particular group, all the projects are dominant, but they're not, they don't have an inner life. So they're missing the whole right-hand side of the circle, but they're good at the left-hand side of the circle, right? And so, you know, they could be your social ministry groups, but, you know, they don't want to pray or they don't want to really reflect, but they're out there, you know, doing all kinds of things. So the balance is really key. So we say they have a lot of mission, but no relationship. Okay? So just think about some of those groups in your parish as well. So what we're really going for is the mission-focused group. 
where every part of the circle they're paying attention to. All right, and that's what you're really trying to do. Now, in terms of your, uh, let's just say this for a second, in terms of your ministry groups, um, every single group in your parish has one of those six elements as a mainstay. All right? They have it as their key thing. So if I said to you, bereavement group, which is their main <coughs> element? Support. Support. Excellent. If I said to you, parish pastoral council, Mission, excellent. Okay. If I said to you, Eucharistic ministers. Could be mission or participation, right? Okay. Uh, if I said to you, uh, youth ministry group. Could be support, right? Could be uh, participation, right? Getting the youth involved. If I say to you prayer group, okay. If I say to you small Christian community, all of them. But what's your particular three, really? Right? I mean, they're all of them. But you know, you could say that they're uh, they're learning and reflection, as well as the rest. Right. When surveys are done about what's the most important uh, thing for people in a small Christian community, though, it comes out as support. Okay. So anyway, you see what I'm saying? So every group in your parish could fit in something like this. But that doesn't excuse them from using the rest of the circle. All right? So anyway, uh, there's a couple of other things you could do with facilitators too uh, and so forth. But um, what I do is we were using this particular resource for Lent. It's called Open Our Hearts, a Small Group Guide for an Active Lent. So when I'm training the facilitators now, I'm going to train them on how to use the book. So that's your practical part as well. So with the practical part, whatever material you're using, you have to go through what the components are in the material. All right? So these happen to be the components of that particular book. So you have to go through that with them. And then if you're doing an evaluation, as Bob said, um, I tried to do a weekly evaluation with my facilitators. They were like, mm-hmm. So that didn't work. So I usually, <laughs> what, I, what I really have to do for them, or uh, with them, is set up a Survey Monkey one. That would be the easiest. But I usually send them something online with one or two questions, and I have them, with the group, fill it out. Okay, I don't want them to fill it out. I want the group to fill it out. All right? So whatever. Uh, and then I just want to show you this. You can evaluate group growth. Okay, how the groups develop. Um, and one of the things that I use, it, this is a very simple one. I take those essential elements and I have the group fill it out. We do and we need to do. All right? And so they really talk about it. Now, I have, like to have every single ministry in the parish do something like this. So when I'm called on to do work with parish ministries, I usually have them, I have a thing that I set up and use it as a handout for that because it helps them see what they're paying attention to in terms of the small group and maybe what they need to do a little bit more of. Yes. So how often do you do that? With the groups? Uh -huh. uh, probably once a year with with my small groups. But if I'm working with uh, ministries, I like to have them do it twice a year, okay? So usually I'm called upon to do it in other parishes, you know, so I'll do a workshop just on this. We do have another book, I'm thinking of rewriting it, we were talking about it yesterday, on um, evaluating a small group so that you move from seasonal group to community. In other words, you actually, it's a developmental process of how you get from one to the other, but I, haven't, I have to pull it out and... Who has time right now? <laughs> but, um, but anyway, something simple like this will really help people to do it. But it, it preclude, it's precluded by really doing, you know, you really have to be able to explain uh, wherever it went to. Bob had it up. That. So to me, those are the most essential elements that we're working with. And people have to know that that's what you're going for and then you can do the we do, we need to do thing. 
I mean, you can even expand that a little bit more by saying, you know, when will we do it, who will we do it, that's pastoral planning, you know. But for now, especially in a small group, that works. Okay, yes? Um, doesn't the nature of a small faith community, like, tend to be inward if you're, like, sharing within your group, you're supporting one another? Where, what are examples of the participation and mission that you would say? Okay, well, it's what Diane's been talking about and what Bob is talking about. So, for example, I remember way back to my first small group, okay, and um, I had been working in a parish in Newark, which is inner city of Newark, and a family was burned out of their building. And so we, we banded together, we took care of that family, we got stuff, we got the rest of the parish to do some things, that's an outward reach. Um, you could be doing some work on, uh, if there's a particular um, political thing coming up, a bill or something, you could work on that. Um, our people do a lot with, we have multiple parishes around us that we work with. So they go to the soup kitchen to work. Uh, they will, we have a monthly food collection. We try to fill up pantries in our area. Um, so a lot of things like that. You, they can do individual works, okay, or they can do group works. The key thing is that the next session, you talk about what did you do as a result of what we did last week. So, for example, in Lent, um, if you use these booklets, for example, um, most of it, there, there's a couple of things in there. Let me go back to those. Okay, this one. You see, in, in a good book, a good material, is going to be broad in terms of what it's going to do. So this one, if you look at this, the usual stuff, setting the environment, prayer, Connecting with life, listening to the word. This is all typical. Appreciating the word. Reflecting on my life. Okay. Next element is reflecting on my home. What's my home life like? What are, what are we doing in the home? And I, we try to make that really generic so that people who have little kids could use it or people who have uh, mixed intergenerational families could use it. All right? So that's a step out of the group. All right? To take a look at that. But the next one is... Reflecting on my parish. What are the things that I can contribute to the parish that we need to do in the parish? In other words, it's taking you another step out. The third one is reflecting on my world or affecting my world. So in affecting my world, in that particular book, there's all kinds of things listed, whether they're global organizations, whether they're um, local organizations, or something that we can do Together. So you're, asked, you're being asked in that particular resource to do something personal to reach out to somebody and to do something as a group. So for example, um, we did a whole, my group did a whole thing for Heifer International, you know, whatever. So that's what you're trying to get people to do. In our parish, we also have something that's very remarkable, and it's called Stewardship Day. And on Stewardship Day, about a thousand people participate and they all do projects in and around the diocese, the parish or the diocese. And so it's a regular part of our parish life to help people move out. So when you're in the group, yes, you are focusing on how am I hearing God in my life, but what do we do with this? Okay, so hence, observe, judge, and act. What needs to be done? Okay, does that help a little bit? But you're right, because groups can stay at the inward focus group. That's why I'm saying take that round thing out and smash it. So you don't want to be like that. As like a facilitator, like somebody has to organize those group activities or no. Uh, in this particular in this particular book, I'll, as the facilitator of my group, I'll say, okay, here's a whole bunch of things. Is there anything here that we feel we could want to work at? Or here's what the stewardship committees going to do and how do we want to be involved in that. Yeah. So that's how I would say something like that. All right? Sister Nancy wants to say something. She's bugging me here. <laughs> About, I don't know, maybe it was 10 years ago, there was this big flood in Arkadelphia. And in, a, in one of our small groups, in one of our parish, they were just praying and, and uh, somebody in the group said, you know, maybe we can help those people in Arkadelphia. 
And now, you know, we're in Pennsylvania, and so the guy goes, well, listen, I have a truck. Well, I can do this. The next day they went to say, Father, see, Father, can we set up a bank account? They canvassed the whole diocese. You know, they, there was an announcement that they're going to take blankets from, our, from Pennsylvania. So my point is just it grew out of the prayer of the small group. Normally the bishop would say, we're going to help Arkadelphia announce it in parishes and filter down. This came from the small group through the parish up to the diocese. And I always say, if you're authentically praying, God is going to call you beyond yourself. That somehow you're going to be moved. And in your small group, God will call, you know, maybe individually but or as a group. So that was just an example that just came from their prayer. They organized the whole thing. So that's key. You know, the, the small group comes up with it. The facilitator tries to... Keep, keep it in focus, but then also to share what you've done. I think that's really key. So thank you. That's a beautiful um, thing. And there's a couple of others. When Hurricane Katrina happened, whoo, our small groups were sending boatloads, uh, not boatloads, but uh, <laughs> truckloads of stuff down to New Orleans. So it depends on how you're, you're doing it. And some of your outreach might be to people in nursing homes or people who are sick in the parish. It doesn't always have to be global. <coughs> yes, Laura? My biggest heartbreak sort of triggers off of that. Um, the two groups, Christ Jesus Parish and RCIA, and they form such incredible intentional communities. Mm -hmm. And then a few may continue, but we lose it. And, and, and how? I mean, we try. We form them into a small Christian community. It's natural, and it doesn't happen. Any suggestions? Well, we have an RCIA, we have a 10 o'clock RCIA that continues, and they just stay. I mean, you know, it's a, it becomes a small Christian community, but then people who are maybe coming into the church or into that particular group, we have the catechumens in another group. But um, it, that's always a hard thing. Sometimes they leave a little for a little while, then they come back. Um, but we try to integrate them. The, what I think Diane was saying before was really key. Where you have a group that actually sponsors a catechumen is really helpful because then they become part of that group. They get to know them. But sometimes people are really busy and they can't do it or their kids or whatever. Um, but keep inviting. Just, uh, but we make a conscious effort to try and do this in our diocese. And one of the ways is we form the groups before they finish the RCIA. You know, we, we help them they, before they get done with the RCIA, we try to get them bonded, or we associate them with another group in, in their parish. So we try to do the bonding before they finish, rather than saying, do you want to do it after they finish? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there's different ways to do it, and I guess the question is like, you know, ask people, what would, they, what would you like to do? But like I said, our 10 o'clock RCIA on Sundays is just continues. So a lot of pictures of people that I have up there are actually in that particular group. They just keep staying. So and uh, plus some of them are even in another group for a seasonal group. So they do two groups, whatever. All right. So do you get the concept of training the facilitators? It's not really hard. You don't have to do uh, PhD work in uh, group dynamics. But uh, check in with your facilitators all the time. So I'm going to turn this back over to Bob.